So I'm going to take you through a quick walkthrough of the BMI and the PIMT on uh, as they work on the Quasi Jupiter Hub. I'm going to do something that I haven't done before, so hopefully this will work. I'm going to do a walkthrough of both. Normally, I would do a introduction to BMI, which is the basic model interface, which you may have heard in some of the talks so far. And then I would go through PyMT, but because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to try to combine them both. So I'm going to show you what the BMI would look like within PyMT. So that I'll show you what it would take or what it would take to implement a BMI <clears throat> for your model, how to use a BMI, and then also how to use a model and run a model in the PyMT. So first of all, I'm on the Quasi Jupiter Hub, and Tian has some instructions on how you can access this. I think she sent them to you. And we will, in the hands-on part of the demo, we can go over, over that. Since there's so few people here, I think uh, that shouldn't be a problem to make sure everyone's up and running. So I'm going to start off with opening up a Jupyter Hub. So go to open with Jupyter Hub. And if you are doing this along with us or in the future, it'll take a lot longer for your hub to start up. But I just uh, started mine up, so it's going to be quite quick. Uh, so we'll start with the BMI walkthrough. And you'll see some notebooks here. And we'll start with uh, just the intro notebook. So as I said, I'm going to start off with a description of the BMI. And there's some links here, uh, the, oh. the basic model interface, the documentation. So we can actually, you know what? I'm going to uh, copy this. I'm going to try to anyway. So the URL is uh, bmi.readthedocs.io. Yeah. Well, no, I'll try to put that in the chat. Oh, I think I just sent that to the chat in the main group. So this is the this is the documentation for BMI. I'm not going to go through it all other to, other than to say that uh, there's basically six different categories of functions that you would have to implement um, and a total of about 30 functions to implement. You don't have to implement them all though. It depends on your model and how just how far you want to go with the BMI and how interoperable you want to make your component. So I'll go through each of these functions in uh, the notebooks and show you what they look like in, uh, in PyMT. There's also some links here for the bindings for the different languages. So we support C, C++, Fortran, and Python. These are the different programming languages that we have BMIs for. And then we have examples that go with them. Uh, these seem to be most of the languages that our community uses certainly that are in our the CSMS model repository. Um, would that I mean does that cover most of them for the, this group here? We have a small group, but are, are there any other languages that you guys use or would want to use that we don't provide, or does that pretty much cover it? No, Python's good here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Python seems to be the most popular language. I think it's the second most popular language in the world these days. I think like I'm the only one, but my prof right? and I use MATLAB. You use MATLAB, Harrison? Yeah, That's I'm okay. sorry. We won't hold it against you, Harrison. Then you'll be the only one who doesn't. <laughs> it's okay. Actually, so too. no, you're absolutely not the only one who uses MATLAB. Uh, we have lots of users of MATLAB, and we don't support it so much because it is it costs money it's proprietary uh, it's closed source so that's the main reason we don't support it however we do have some projects where we have brought uh, matlab models into pymt um, we've just done these on one-off basis and the way that we do that is to use um, an open source version of matlab called octave have you ever used that harrison or anyone else it um it's, it's very good. It's not MATLAB, so it's not quite as nice as MATLAB. Uh, but using that, it, it's a long process. So we have to convert the MATLAB to Octave, which isn't too hard. And then get Octave into Python uh, is another step. And then we can bring it in. Um, so we have done it before. Um, 
after all those steps, depending on your model, it might be easier just to translate it to Python. So, you know, so that's that's how we would support uh, Python right now. Another language that people seem to use is R and Julia. And so people have started to write BMIs for both of those languages. I think we have uh, BMIs for both of those languages. We just don't have any models that we brought into the PyMT yet. Um, and then, I'll, and then I'm gonna talk about the Python modeling toolkit. So this is the Python package that we developed at CSDMS to, it's a BMI aware framework. So it works with components that have a BMI. And because the BMI is a standard interface, we can write code that works with a BMI, a general BMI component. So it makes it easy to bring components in and work with them. And it takes, so it, the Python modeling toolkit is a collection of BMI models from all the different languages, well, all the different languages that we support. It is also a, and we have all of these loaded up on a HydraShare. So all of the models are contributed by the community and they may or may not work on all the different platforms. So when people write a, a model in C, they're not always concerned with running it on, for example, Windows. And so we can't support Windows if they haven't provided Windows support. The one nice thing that we've done here is that we've loaded all the components that we have onto HydraShare so you're working in a, it's going to be a Linux environment, but you'll be able to have uh, you exposed, you'll be exposed to all of the different models that you can run. If you were to try to run them all on your laptop, you may or may not be able to, depending on what operating system you're in. Python modeling toolkit, so it's a library of models. It also provides tools for coupling different models together. So when you're coupling models, there's a lot of problems in doing that. One we talked about is the language problem. Another one is that they need to speak the same, I don't want to say the same language. They need to have the same interface. So you, so we don't want to have to support every idiosyncratic interface for every model. And that, the BMI solves that problem. So once we put a little bit of uh, work onto the developer to create a BMI, um, and then we, but then we can use it. Um, but then there's other details that the Python modeling toolkit would deal with when coupling models like unit conversion. So the BMI doesn't specify that a component uses any particular set of units, but it, it just, the BMI just reports the units. And then the PyMT, you can use that to convert units. Models come on different grids. Some will be unstructured grids. Some might be structured quadrilaterals, triangles, um, different sizes, different resolutions. Python modeling toolkit will provide some tools for mapping different grids to one another. I don't, I'm not gonna go over all of those today, but there are some notebooks that covers that that you could do by yourself or <clears throat> in the time that we have at the end. Uh, if you have uh, any questions or any issues or you just wanna say hi to us, you can uh, click on the issues on GitHub and file an issue on GitHub. We generally don't have people filing issues just to say hello, but I think that would be great. Uh, so that would be github.com CSTMS PyMT issues. Um, and so we have a, a bunch of issues now that are still ongoing. There you go. And so that's the introduction. Um, and then so that what I'm going to do now is open up the next notebook. And then I'm going to take you through what a component looks like in PyMT. And a specific component we're going to look at is the coastline evolution model. But before we begin, are there any questions? People have any uh, any questions about any that stuff? Or... So, as I said, we're going to talk about the we're going to use the coastline evolution model as an example. Are any of you coastal people at all? No. <laughs> Uh, not particularly either, but uh, hopefully it'll still give you an idea of what a model looks like in PyMT. And showing you how it, the CEM works in PyMT, it really, because all the models look the same, if you know how to use one model, you should be able to get up and running with any of the models. So this is uh, just a diagram of what the CEM does. So it's a model that, that uh, simulates the evolution of a, a delta along a coast. So this blue line here, I hope you can see it, 
is a river going to the river mouth. It carries sediment that's deposited into the river. And then waves act on the sediment uh, and cause a longshore transport. And then you can build out deltas like we see here. Does anyone have any idea what delta this is? It sounds like you guys might not if it's uh, if you guys aren't coastal people. I think it looks like a penguin, but uh, I was gonna ask that question if you knew. <laughs> yeah, I do know. I, I okay. this is it's a kind of a well-known delta, I guess, only because I think I think because it looks like a penguin and it's cute looking. Uh, it's the Ebro Delta in Spain. Uh, the, sorry, no one wins the beer. I was going to give a beer to uh, whoever got that right, but I take that back. I, I'll, I'll buy the next round. Thank you for coming to the. Right. So what we have here is, so this is a schematic of what the model would look like. So if we see the, so it's on a grid. So I've drawn these grid cells are huge. I just wanted to show that we're going to be operating on a rectilinear grid. And that's where the values are going to be. And we're going to be uh, looking at seawater depth. So we're going to be adding sediment, creating a delta, and then obviously shallowing the, the ocean water. So that's where we're going to go. Um, but to get there, we're going to look at some of the capabilities of, of PyMT and what the model looks like in PyMT. So I'm going to go, th I'm going to go run through these. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to go too quickly, but uh, so please let me know if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions, again, just jump right in. So in PyMT, the, you can import this variable called models. I hope you all are somewhat familiar with Python. If not, again, please just ask questions and uh, I'll... Uh... So this variable models is a dictionary, a Python dictionary, and it's gonna be a dictionary that maps uh, model names to actual classes that implement the model. So for instance, we can see what, so this keys function is a standard dictionary function, method function for Python dictionaries. And then you can see these are all the, the names of the models that we have loaded right now on the HydroShare for PyMT. And as I said before, all of these models may not, if you were to run all of this on your local computer, which you totally can, some of these components might not be available because we just haven't built them for Windows is Windows is usually the problem. Normally we can, I shouldn't say problem. We can normally get them working for Mac and Linux. Those seem to be the standard ones because that's what people program in. Uh, they create the models in, but we don't always, they don't always run them on Windows or build them on Windows. So anyway, those are the models we use and CEM should be in here and we see it is at the end here. So that's the one we're going to use. So we can access it either, either as a regular Python dictionary in the, using this syntax with the square brackets and then the name of the model as a string or just as a straight attribute. And that's what I, I'm going to be using here. So then we, so CEM with a capital C is a class. And then we can instantiate the class and create an instance of CEM. We can create more, if we wanted to, we could create two, three, four, whatever instances of CEM all at once in the same memory space and they could all run independently of one another. But today we're just gonna run one. So for instance, you could, in a notebook, you could create a whole bunch of CEMs, maybe with some different set of input parameters and then just farm them out to a whole bunch of processors and run them in parallel all from one notebook. So as I said, we're going to go through the basic model interface and just show you what a uh, component looks like in PyMT and just what it would, might take to implement uh, a BMI for your model, or for any model. So there's model information functions. This provides just some static metadata about the model. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. And I would think if you tried to imagine how you could do that for a model, it would be pretty easy. You would just write a, a function that returned a string. That's the name of your model. So in this case, CEM, pretty easy. Uh, they're not all so easy. Um, there are two more that we're gonna look at here, the output var names and then the input var names. So this would be a function that just returns a list of strings. Uh, the output var names are all the variables that can dynamically change. So this is part of the state of the model. And so as a model's running, these will be updated. 
So you'll see that seawater depth is one of the variables in the output of our names. And that's the one that we're going to be mainly concerned with with our simulation today. And then the input var names. So this is also a list of strings. We can go over exactly why these strings are so crazy looking and so long. But these are the variables that another component or a user can change dynamically as the model's running. So for instance, what we're going to be doing here, the sea surface wave height. So we're going to be changing the wave height and the wave direction as the model's running. And one thing to note here is that before, so CEM was, a, it's a C library. It was a program, it was a command line program, and you would just run it. You would set up, you know, the initial conditions and you just run it. But now that it's in PyMT, it's, and it's in Python, you, know, you can run this interactively. And so that's a new capability that we offer for some of these models. Uh, so a model written in C, now you can play with and you can run it for a little while, change some parameters in its state, and then advance it again. And so that adds a new capability to it that it didn't have before. So as I said, some of these names are a little unusual. Uh, so what we're we're going to we want is water depth Oops. is the output variable we want to look at and we're going to change some input variables too as the model's running so we're going to adjust the sediment supply we're going to add rivers we're going to turn off sediment supply we're going to increase the sediment supply and then we can also change the wave heights and periods as it's running so if so those are the the common names for them and then they would map to these standard names under that we're listing here in the table. So the standard name, so we have a conventional name and a standard name. The standard name is intended to be a very descriptive string that describes the variable. So when we're coupling models, we wanna be sure that we're exchanging the same variable. So that's why these are so long. Uh, they're just very specific. So some of them are pretty easy to figure out. Uh, water depth is seawater depth, that's pretty good. Sediment supply, though, is a little unusual. Land, surface, water, sediment, bed load, mass flow rate. Uh, so the, I'm not gonna go over the standard names for all, oops, for all of these as they, it's a much longer discussion, but you'll notice that each of them has a double underscore. And so the, what, the words to the right of that double underscore is the quantity and the words to the left is the object. So the quantity here is depth, mass flow rate, height, period, velocity. And then to the left is actually, what is it the velocity of? What is the height of? And so that's the form of these. Uh, if you go to our website, we have a long list, a dictionary of, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand, maybe I think it's probably 3000 names. And so generally when people are writing a BMI, they can consult that dictionary and they'll be able to find the name that they're looking for. And if not, you can contact us and we can get you in touch with the, the people to help you out with that. Uh, if you are doing this, please don't let this, please don't get hung up on this. Just, just call it whatever you want and we can fix that later. Um, this is, uh, it's a detail, uh, but the, we, we don't want that to hold you up in creating BMIs. So I think the other names are probably pretty, you could probably figure them, uh, the other names out too. Um, I'm not much model time, so that's a pretty easy one, but these are the ones that we're gonna be working with today. So every component in, uh, in PyMT, you can get help on, and we'll look at the help for CEM. And the help messages will look very similar for all the components in PyMT. Uh, it'll give a brief description of the model. So this is CEM. So if you were to go through this notebook on your own, you, instead of working with CEM, you could work with any of these other components that we have loaded and this would, it would look very similar. There's some also some other metadata like the author of the component, the version, the license, the DOI and the URL. One thing we wanna be very careful of with these components is that, so you're accessing this through PyMT and that's something we wrote and BMI, that's all our stuff, but this model is not ours. And we wanna be very clear that it, to give credit to whoever has contributed the model. And so we want to, so that we've done that in the, in the help message here. Let's see. 
So you can get lots of other metadata on the component too. You can get the version. Let's see, I don't know, I guess DMI should be, oops. VOI. And then references, there's a site as attribute for every component. So and this is just gonna be a list of any references that the component author, so Brad may have provided for us. And unfortunately, I think in CM, there actually aren't any. <laughs> he didn't submit any references, not to say that there aren't any, but he just didn't submit any. We could, uh, let's see, how are we doing? Yeah. I'll leave it up for, uh, as an exercise for the reader to uh, instantiate a different component and look for the references for it. There should be lots. Uh, if you want to, child would be a good one. That's just the information functions, fairly easy to implement, and I think pretty straightforward to use. The next set is the model control functions. And these ones are a little bit, or they can be a little bit more difficult to implement. Um, if you're starting from scratch though, I would say they're not very difficult to implement at all. If the problem with, if you have an existing model, if it did wasn't written with this BMI design pattern in mind, these, functions, initializing the update function may all be together and you may have to pull them apart and refactor your code just a little bit. So there's, I'm gonna go over just two of the control functions. So one is initialize. Every component will have an initialize method and it'll take an argument that is the name of an input file. And so what's gonna happen here is CEM is gonna read that input file. So this is just a, in this case, it's just a text file with some input parameters. It'll allocate memory, it'll initialize the memory and it'll just get the model ready for time stepping. So if you can think of your model in code, you'll have a bunch of stuff at the beginning, you'll have a for loop over time, and then all this stuff in the for loop is going to be in the update method, but all the stuff above the for loop is in initialize. So now we've initialized CEM and we're ready to go, we're ready to time step. I think before I do that though, I'll show you what an input file for CEM looks like. Um, and then we'll get, I'll return to this in the future. Um, yeah. So this is what the CEM's input file happens to look like. So I've just included one for you on our HydroShare uh, repository just to get you running. But you notice it's not the greatest input file. It really is just a string of numbers. It's not clear what the numbers are. So to use this initialize method, you have to have an existing input file. And they're not, they're always idiosyncratic and they're sometimes easy to use, sometimes difficult to use. But we'll get back to this. PyMT provides a method for creating input files programmatically so that you can create, regardless of the component you're using, you can create them uh, in the same way. So, but for now, we're just going to stick with the one that we have. And then the update method will update CEM or any component just by one time step. Uh, there's an optional BMI method called update until that will take one argument that is a, a time. And then so you do update until a time and it would update several time steps possibly until it reaches that time. Not all models can implement that. It just depends on how they're, they themselves are implemented. Some require a fixed time step. So it's not always available. Now, how do we know that CEM was updated by that one time step? Well, we can look at the time functions. So again, so we have a start time. So this is a BMI method, it starts at time zero, and then we'll look at the time step in the units. So CEM's time step is 0.2 and 0.2 what? 0.2 days. So now we've updated CEM one time step. So if we do CEM.time, if I've done this correctly, it should be 0.2. Uh, CEM has uh, in implemented the update until, and so this would be an example of how you would how, we, how you could use that. So update until 1.0. So we're almost through the we're through the main BMI methods. I think the update until the update uh, and the initialize methods are the main ones. But now we can get information about 
the variables. So these are the state variables. So for instance, we're looking at the output variable names as we saw before. These are state variables that CEM exposes to the user. And each of these, these aren't uh, typically methods that you would use if you're using it within PyMT, but if you were to implement a BMI for a component, you would need to implement these. This gives metadata about the actual variables, so the units, so seawater depth is in meters. Again, we don't specify what unit system to use, only just have to report what the units are. The variable type, so these are floats. So this is all metadata that PyMT uses to, for instance, allocate memory. And then every variable is defined on a grid, and a grid can have multiple variables and a model can have multiple grids. So this is just an identifier for which grid seawater depth is defined at. It's just an integer, it could be whatever number, but we will use this number later on to get information about that grid. So seawater depth is on a grid ID two, and that as we saw in the, uh, I'm just gonna scroll up here. So that's gonna be this, we don't know this yet because we haven't called the correct functions, but I'm just telling you that the seawater depth is actually defined on this rectilinear grid. So it's going to be a 2D grid with rows and columns. Uh, and then there, so what I'm going to show here is just that these are all the output variables and these are the grid IDs. So there's actually several different grids that CEM has. So the, uh, the sea, the, uh, the, the, the water depth and the bed load flux are on grid uh, two. So that's what we have, that's what we're gonna be using when we uh, get information about the grids. Now a model component or a data component isn't very useful and, until you can get actually get values from it. And so this is gonna be the get value. So every component is gonna have a get value method because if you didn't have a get value method, the model wouldn't be very useful. The data set wouldn't be very useful if you couldn't get data out of it. So again, so the, all the get value method will take this string, which is an output, something that's listed in the output var names. So seawater depth. So if you run this, we just get a NumPy array. It's a flat array of all the seawater depths in meters. We can also, so the opposite of the get value would be the set value. Now, if, so this is all the set value. We can only call set value on variables that are listed in the input bar names. So what we're doing here is we're setting the wave height period and angle, incoming wave angle for the component. And so this is what we'll be doing every time step when we're running the model, or what we could be doing every time step when we're running the model, changing the wave heights for every time step. And then finally, we'll just do a quick uh, overview of the grid functions. And then that'll be an introduction to a quick introduction to the PyMT. So as we said, the, or as I showed you, the seawater depth is on a rectilinear grid. And this is the actual grid here. So we can use this PyMT method that tries to plot a variable name. That's the first argument using matplotlib. And so what we have here in the bottom the bottom six kilometers or so is the delta with a flat initial flat coastline. And then we can see that the ocean floor falls off linearly uh, towards the top of the diagram. So this is the initial model grid for the water depth. So just, this is just repeating the, to get the grid that the seawater depth is defined on is grid two. And then we can call the grid type, the grid method. So these all begin with grid underscore. So we, for instance, can get the grid type. So the grid type here is rectilinear. Other components may not have rectilinear grids. They may have unstructured grids. They may not have a grid at all. They may have a grid of points, just points, unconnected points. But because it is uniform rectilinear, it has a number, it has rows and columns. That's how we would define that. And so you could get the shape of the grid and then the row and column spacing of the grid. So for CEM, that would be, so we have a hundred rows, 200 columns and 200 meter, meter spacing between each of them. 
So that is defines the, the grid for CEM. Uh, so that takes us through a quick demonstration of what a component looks like in BMI or a BMI component looks like in PyMT and maybe gives you an idea of what it would take to implement a BMI yourself. Um, are there any questions before I go out? I've got one more notebook that's actually going to run uh, CEM and then we can play with wave angle and, and sediment supply things. Um, yeah, sure. Eric, is there a different, um... I don't, I don't know what to call it, like a, a script for converting different files for input, like a, a net CD file. I, I don't know, like what do you do about, is, is there just a different syntax for that? Um, yeah, uh, you, so well, it depends on, I think Tian may cover this a little bit. So okay. that could be yeah. a, a data component. Okay. So for instance, you could have uh, a net CDF. So what, what we're going to be doing here is, is um, coupling CEM with waves. Mm -hmm. And so the waves can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of those places waves could come from could be a net CDF file. And so what we would have would be a BMI that wraps a general net CDF file so that you can access that net CDF file through a BMI in the same way that you are doing it with, uh, with CEM. So the net CDF file itself would have a BMI. Oh. And if that kind of makes sense. And you could also have a BMI for a CSV file that just reads in a time series of ways from a CSV file. And our goal is to make that seamless so that you don't, it doesn't matter what format the file, the data are stored in, mm -hmm. but just as long as you can use the BMI, you can access it. I'm not sure if I answer your question, but Okay, yeah, I just I just don't have that much experience with it. So I'm just trying to imagine like what 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 it takes. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's a big problem. Uh, you know, every comp every model has its own crazy, particularly with input files, its own crazy set of input files, and then also output file formats. And so we would we're trying to harmonize all that and make it easier for people to use so that they don't have to know how to read oh. net CDF files and things. So it, it's a big problem. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions before we continue? Yeah, I guess I, so my my entire introduction to numerical modeling has been through Land Lab. Um, yeah. And I, I think I can see like in here, you've got the update. Uh, is that basically like run one step in, uh, uh, yeah. in Land Lab? Yeah, that's okay. exactly. That's exactly right. Um, Land Lab and and PyMT they're actually quite they're they're closely related. We have scripts that or we have a package in Land Lab that will automatically wrap a Land Lab component with a BMI. So I think if we were to look at the components that we have loaded on the HydroShare right now, I think some of them are probably the BMI version of Land Lab components. So if you were to look at those, you might recognize some of them. Um, so yeah, um, what I would like to do in the future is to do the reverse. So we can bring a land lab component into PyMT, but I'd like to actually do the other and bring this, for instance, the coastal evolution model into land lab. So we could run on a land lab grid and interact with land lab components. So that's something that we're going to be doing as well. So cool. Yeah, that, yeah, that was going to be my next question. Like if, if there is an easy way to do that other than maybe like, a, I don't know, figuring out how to get an output from this into the input or yeah um, yeah cool yeah right now there isn't I, I guess i'd say there isn't an easy way to do it right now but there will be and because the bm all the components in pymt have that standard interface it should be fairly easy to write a wrapper to bring them into land lab because land lab also has a standard interface they're not exactly the same but they're compatible they follow the same design pattern thanks Okay, so now we're going to run uh, the CEM model. So again, this is our, our penguin delta. I don't think we'll be able to build a delta quite that pretty today, but if you guys want to play with it later on, you can try and see, see how far you get. 
So we're going to just do a few steps uh, that we did last time. So we'll just start off by bringing the model into PyMT and initializing it. And so, oh, so this, so we get back to the CEM input file. So as I said, we provided, I provided you with uh, an input file, but it, you know, maybe you don't want that input file. Maybe you want to use something else. So I'm going to show how PyMT can help with that. We can get help on it. And if we scroll down a little bit further than before, I, I didn't get down to this. We can look at some parameters. And so these parameters are values in that input file. So if you remember what the input file looked like, it was very opaque. It was just a whole bunch of numbers, but they re represented this. I don't know what order they are, but these are the numbers. And so, or these are the variables. So PyMT provides a setup method and as keywords, you pass it those variables. So in this case, we're going to call setup. This is not a BMI function. This is a PyMT function. And we're going to pass it the number of rows is 100, columns is 200 with a grid spacing of 200. And then it will take those keywords, those values, and just plug them into the correct places of the CEM input file. So if we, <clears throat> let's see. I'm going to do this. So it returns the name of the input file that it created and the location of it. So it, it, in this case, it's created in a temporary directory. So just to see that it worked, we'll have a look at the input file. So it looks similar to the other one, but now let's uh, let's change the number of columns to 400 and make sure so that it created a new temporary directory. And then so okay, so this one changed to 400. So apparently this is the number of columns. So the setup method will take uh, a bunch of keywords and create an input file for your model. So model in the input files can be much more complex than this. But hopefully the idea is that you don't have to worry about the crazy different formats of all the input files. And you can create it programmatically through Python. So I'm going to use this new input file. So now it's initialized. So now we're ready to run. As before, we're going to look at the water depths. So we're going to just get some information about the grid. So this is, we've already did this in the last notebook. So I'm just going to run through this a little bit quickly. We can see that the grid, as before, is uniform rectilinear. It's 2D. And it has 100 rows and 200 columns with a grid spacing of 200. And this, this is the initial or a part of the NumPy array that represents the water depths. So minus 1 is on land and positive values are because it's water depth uh, they get deeper towards the bottom or the top of the of the diagram we we're looking at before and as before we'll just this will be our initial bathymetry and then we've got then we're going to set the wave so the incoming wave height so we can set that uh, these are the values before that we used um you know what since there's few people here i'm going to give you your money's worth i'm going to go off script here and i'm just going to see what happens so now i'm going to change the uh the wave angle now is going to be 45 degrees i'm not sure whether it's 45 degrees this way or this way but hopefully we'll be able to figure it out um and just as a disclaimer, um, these you know these models are research models that are contributed to us. Um, sometimes they don't fail gracefully, we'll say. Um, so we'll see if we, how this works. I, I think it'll work, but we'll uh, we'll see. Okay, and now we're going to create uh, a grid of. Or we're going to set the sediment supply. So the sediment supply, I'm going to scroll up to the top again here, is also defined on the same grid as the seawater depths. 
So you can have sediment supplies from any point on the grid. And so what I'm going to do is add sediment supply to the center of the grid, and it's going to create a delta that's going to go straight out. And so that's what we're going to do here. So this is row zero, column 100. So if we go right here, so row zero is down here, is, oh, you can't see where 20 is, around 20 kilometers, and then it's gonna go straight out, and that's where the river is gonna hit the ocean, and that's where we're gonna deposit sediment. And this is just to show you what the units that we're using are. So this is kilograms per second. And then our time steps. Okay, so now we're ready to run the model. So we're going to advance the model for 3,000 days, because that's the unit, the time step unit. For every iteration through the loop, we're going to call the set value method, and we're going to change the, the bed load flux. In this case, we're, we're going to keep it constant, so we don't actually have to call this every time. But, you know, you could have an if statement in this loop where, you know, if time is less than a thousand, this is the discharge. If it's greater than a thousand, it's a different discharge. So you, you could add that to your time loop. So it'll take just a little while to run. Um, while we wait for it, there, if there's any questions. Uh, Right, so we have the, the sediment coming straight out and then the waves coming either this direction or this direction. Well, we're not sure which. And they're constant, so there, there's no variation to the waves. So that's why I'm a little concerned. <laughs> so some of the models that are being added to this kind of ecosystem are uh, older ones that are kind of updated for it as opposed to just new stuff developed purpose yeah. built yeah yeah a lot of these components actually that we have here are, are previous component the previous models that we have refactored a little bit to so that we could put a bmi on them okay well it ran without crashing so that's that's good we'll look at the time and so that's the correct time so let's hope that we've built a delta ah so we have built a delta but it's a little bit crazy so it looks to me like the waves are coming from, well, I'm not sure if what your screen sees, but I think you can see which direction the waves are coming from. And I actually created these little waves along the coast, which is interesting, sediment waves, little mini ones. The boundary conditions for the CEM are wraparound boundary conditions. So when sediment leaves, I'm pointing at my screen like you can see my finger. So when the uh, sediment leaves one side, it gets introduced to the other side. And so what you see here is some little periodic waves in the coastline, which is interesting. Okay, so let's add a second source of sediment. So the other one was in the middle. At, so this is column, that was column 100. So now we're going to keep that one. We're going to add a new one at column 1500. So it's going to be over here somewhere. Or no, column 150. And fit, we're going to add a little bit more sediment to that one. So it's going to be a little bit stronger. But we're still going to have two, uh, two uh, rivers going straight out. Just for fun. And because I was getting a little crazy, I'm going to change the wave angle again. I'm going to move it back to zero. So now we're going to have the waves go coming straight in. And we're going to run it for seven, another 700, a couple of years, 750 days. Take a little while, run, but there. So now we have, so now it's flattened it a little bit because now we've got the waves coming straight in. And so it's diffusing those little bumps that we saw. And so the, uh, so we can see this, the, the delta in the middle is still building out a little bit. And then there's a delta to the right that we have added with a little bit more sediment to it. And you can see there's a little, so a few lagoons and stuff that's actually formed. 
So now, so for the last step, we're just going to shut off sediment supply. So I hope you can see that how we can easily uh, change the model and run it interactively. And so what I'm doing here is I'm manually adding, changing the waves and the sediment supply. But I hope you could imagine that we could easily get that from another, a data component, those, those information, or from another model, another component. So now we've, so this first line sets everything in the, in the sediment supply to zero. And then we're going to run it to for another 250 days, I guess. There. And so it's so, so again, we have no sediment supply, waves still coming in from the top, and we've just diffused out the delta. So now we've got a nice smooth delta. Well, that's all I had for you. I, I hope that that was all right. I hope you learned something.